Hello and welcome to this Sainsbury Centre online event. My name is Tanya Moore and I'm the Joyce and Michael Morris Chief Curator of Art at the Sainsbury Centre. I'm really pleased to introduce this evening's event on the occasion of the exhibition Empowering Art, Indigenous Creativity and Activism from North America's Northwest Coast, currently on display at the Sainsbury Centre. This groundbreaking exhibition brings together exceptional contemporary and historical works from across the northwest coast of North America. Developed in close consultation with Indigenous artists and community leaders from across the northwest coast, Empowering Art showcases the talent of their artistic and cultural creations on a scale unseen in the UK since the 1970s. Bringing a contested past into the realities of the present, the exhibition tells the story of a coastline with distinctive artistic and cultural traditions where creative exchange is visible in historical objects but also resonates through contemporary art. I'm delighted to introduce artist Morgan Asoff and exhibition co-curator Jack Davey who will be in conversation this evening. Simsian artist Morgan Asoff joins us from British Columbia. A multidisciplinary artist, Morgan works across jewellery, engraving and photography. The photography series Royal Portraits, a series contemplating Indigenous Northwest Coast ideals, is currently on display at the Sainsbury Centre. The portraits depict community leaders and activists working on issues like climate justice, missing and murdered Indigenous women, and protesting the expansion of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, pointing back to an honoured past and forward to an innovative, autonomous Indigenous future. Dr Jack Davey joins us from London. Jack has worked in the heritage of marginalised peoples for over a decade, focusing in particular on the cultural oppression of Indigenous communities from North America. He has a PhD in anthropology and has worked for the British Museum, Horniman Museum and the University of East Anglia. He is currently head curator at Morley College in London. This is a pre-recorded event, so please leave any thoughts or comments below the video or get in touch via our social media channels. Hello everybody and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Jack Davey, I'm the curator of Empowering Art at the Sainsbury Centre for Visual Arts and I'm really, really pleased and privileged today to be joined by Morgan Asoff, one of the artists featured in the show, uh, who's going to be hopefully talk to us about her, her art practice and, uh, and particularly the intersection of art and activism on the Northwest Coast. So Morgan, thank you so much. Are you, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? I'm um, sure. Hi, my name is Morgan Asaf. I'm a Simshian artist, um, originally from my own territory between Terrace and Prince Rupert in northern BC, um, Eagle Clan territory. And yeah, I'm excited to talk to you guys a bit about um, what my practice is to me and sort of how how I am led by community to like do certain types of work. So yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we'll, we'll start with your works that are in the show. You you um, you, you had a series of, of photographs, the uh, the Royal Portrait series, that's, that's correct. And they, um, I, I was totally blown away by them and really excited by them when I first saw them because I thought they were a brilliant way of portraying to a contemporary British audience who know very little about uh, current um, Indigenous uh, issues and priorities in a really visually and aesthetically beautiful and stunning way. Um, so I wondered if you could you could kind of tell us a bit about the Royal Portrait series and how, how it came about and what it was you were really trying to capture with those photographs. Yeah, so well, I've done shows before, but I usually haven't um, included photography with it. And with this show, it was really important to me that there was a way of sort of visually like disseminating um, sort of points in our culture that are both modern and um, historical, um, sort of, I guess, our our current culture, <laughs> and especially um, in regards to, like, the youth and the people that are out there doing a lot of work around making life better for our people. Um, and so, yeah, this was, I, I had these ideas around, like, how do we visually show like the matriarchy how do we visually show like our royalty and what what we consider royalty and how different that is because when it's not based on commercialism it's based upon you know and it's not based upon money wealth but it's based upon wealth of character and um wealth of community um and so yeah i, I that's kind of where this whole show started many many years ago um 
and sort of working with these ideas of um, the crowns, but in terms of Northwest Coast royalty and how we wore frontlets um, and we had shaman's crowns um, and what those would look like using different materials and sort of like speaking to the idea um, of, of like, yeah, like how do we really just like highlight how different our idea of royalty is? Um, because it's in Northwest Coast culture, it's very based on like how well you take care of your people, how well your people are eating, how safe are they like, you know, and, um, and so I also just like, there's kind of, there was a gap going on that is slowly getting better, um, where, you know, a lot of times our people that are doing all this work in activism aren't necessarily getting recognized enough with like regalia items and, um, like visually dressed in that way. Um, so I thought it would be really important to sort of like find ways to really hold them up visually with the art form. Um, obviously on the coast, we love the art form so much. Everybody loves it. Um, it's a very much like a social ranking thing as well. So when you're like held up by like a beautiful regalias and you have all your pieces that you know that like the community holds you up and like you're well loved kind of. Um, so yeah, I sort of wanted to try and show those ideals in a way that could be understood by different people anywhere. Um, especially the photos are nice because you're able to sort of like transmit them almost anywhere. Um, in, whereas having physical pieces in the people there all the time is more difficult, right? So yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. Um, uh, speaking of like wealth of character, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about, about the people you selected to, to appear in those photographs and, and particularly in the notes you sent us photographs, you talk about some of the work they're doing in the community. And I wondered if you could you talk a little bit more about, about those people and, and their, and their work. Yeah. So I definitely, um, I wanted to choose people to try and sort of like help amplify their voices. Um, and really just like show like what what I myself even consider royalty and matriarchy and um like and how that's also inclusive of like two spirit people and um so I ended up choosing a bunch of different people and they're mostly all people that do a lot of work in activism um so like specifically some of them right now are doing a lot of work with climate activism um because our government here in Canada chooses to continue to like support projects that are both bad for indigenous territories and bad for our so sovereignty and then also just like not good for carbon emissions um which is really frightening and like they're using taxpayer money to do that and then they have our CMP sort of enforcing that and um so a lot of people are doing work around that to just to try and like really push forward that like this isn't like climate leadership is not building pipelines and like encroaching on indigenous sovereignty in our own territories it's just like it's not okay anymore like we're done with it um so and then also just doing work like there's um Lorelai Williams does a lot of work around MMIW activism and still does these are really all just people so I don't know like how educated um your market is on MMIW, but it's missing and murdered Indigenous women and Two Spirit, and um, and so this is really just a huge ongoing problem um, where our people are targeted so much more for murder and abuse, and then also like it isn't investigated enough, and we've continued to sort of like fight against that by everything from trying to get these um, investigations going to just simply going out and looking physically for people. Um, so those are some of the things that um, people have to do here is sort of put their own bodies, mental health, finances on the line and just go out and do these things every day um, to try and hope that we can um, that we can make a better life for our people. Right. Yeah. So that, that everybody that I chose is like these just really amazing people that really strong voices and out there just doing a lot of work. Um, that they feel that that's their calling, kind of like I feel like my art form is my calling. Um, so really just trying to support them and uplift their voices and also just like 
shower them with beautiful regalia because they deserve it, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that really comes across in, in, in the in the portraits. And thank you for explaining that because I was about to ask you to. I, I'm familiar with it, of course, but the yeah, yes. our audience probably not so familiar with the campaign. So thank you for that. Um and um the the can you talk a little bit about the settings of the photographs, the backdrops to them. I know some are in kind of in, in the forests and others are in more community kind of uh, spaces i wondered if you the kind of thinking that went into where these people were standing and what what was kind of visible around them if you like yeah i wish that at the time the weather hadn't been so difficult because we kind of had to like make things work um we really wanted to do some that were more of like an industrial looking setting just to sort of remind people of the like the the links between extractive industry and how that affects indigenous people and how that affects um, missing and murdered Indigenous women, um, especially. And then we also wanted to sort of like do some things that were in the cedars. Um, cedars are protection. Cedars are like everything. They We make our homes out of them and our canoes. And we, they do a lot of medicine for us. So um, like I also wanted to show that as well. Um, because on the one hand, you want to be like, no, this is so bad. Like, you guys have to stop doing this. It's not okay. This is wrong. The government has to stop. The police have to stop. Like, And on the other hand, you don't want that to be all you're representing. You want to be like, these women, these girls, these missing people and two-spirit people, like, we also, we love you. We want you to be in, like, medicine. And we want to show that strength that we have to continue to do this work for them because because they deserve that from us as well, you know? Yeah. No, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's a very powerful message. And I think it comes across very strongly in the, in the, in the images. Um, I feel like even if you don't actually know exactly why it still gives a feeling, you know? I, I absolutely agree. Yeah, absolutely. I do. And I think it's, um, it's why I wanted to have those as, as the, as you, as you walk along the corridor, leaving the exhibition there along the walls. So it's, it's a real, kind of this is now this is this is indigenous priority today um this is indeed indigenous people today this is indigenous art today to really drive home to again a british audience who are not very familiar with contemporary indigenous issues that th these are living people living art that's still very very prevalent today and i think your, your images do that beautifully um because i understand you have uh, you you're kind of an activist yourself as well as well as kind of within your art or as part of within your art i suppose but you're also kind of out there campaigning and and you know involved in these campaigns kind of personally yourself is that that's correct isn't it um yeah i i definitely try and support as much as i can i i guess i don't always consider myself as an activist but i for sure i do a lot of activism work so i guess that's what it is it's like People will be like, oh, you're like a fashion designer. And I'm like, no, I'm not really a fashion. I don't do it full time, right? So I, I don't consider that. But um, yeah, like, and I think I think that I guess the activism is really just like doing what you think is right to like make things better in, in things that you care about, you know? And um, because um, I've grown up here as a Native woman and two-spirit person, like I've definitely like lost very very many people and there sort of just continues to be ongoing violence all the time and so those are things that when like one of the people that i photographed to kaya um they're like 19 in those photographs so it's like these are people who are out here like as youth you don't really have a choice but to to try and get out there and like do the work because there's nobody else doing it for us you know like we just have to like keep keep fighting the system basically because it's just like really stacked up against us and and we're still experiencing these high volumes of suicide we're experiencing violence like like to our friends and family like ongoingly and you know even though each generation like i feel like like my dad's like um also an artist and he's always been very adamant about talking about residential stool talking about different things and not like being silent on things um but we're still generation after generation, we're still kind of dealing with the same stuff. So, um, so yeah, it's definitely like, I don't think you can help but be a bit, a bit of an activist if you care about those things. Um, because I don't like, I don't want my daughter to have to grow up and dealing with as much as, as I did or as the youth today are dealing with. So if we right. can make it a little better each generation, I'm definitely down for that. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, uh, Bill Reed, the, the you know the Hydra artist, he he was of the contention that all Northwest Coast artists are activists by their very nature, um, and I think that that's something we've tried to get across in the in the exhibition, which also talks about residential schools and that legacy of genocide. Um, yeah, and I definitely I do think that like it's like an act of resistance for us to just continue to practice our culture regardless because you know it was outlawed and banned for so long like literally illegal but our people were still like no nope, we're doing this <laughs> and so you know and so it's managed to survive and flourish where a lot of people thought it would just sort of die out and and that was the purpose of colonization but but um yeah so i think really like the act of just like living as an indigenous person is definitely like an act of resistance um and if you can and i think the art form is really special because it helps like it decolonizes in a really gentle way. <laughs> um, uh, what, what, I, what I've always found fascinating about about Northwest Coast kind of art activism that you're talking about is the way that it um, it, it does it in ways that aren't immediately apparent to the viewer, but actually kind of changes the way they think as they look at it. And that's something I really tried to bring into this exhibition was, was this this idea of these artworks as having this this power to kind of transform thinking. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, I think that, like, I mean, imagine the marketing that Northwest Coast Art has just done on its own. Like, it's spread through the world. People love it. They connect to it, right? And that gives us more of a voice, too. So I really think that's, like, the ancestral. Like, it's like our ancestors were like, nope, this is too powerful. Like, you can't stop it, you know? And um, and through that art form, we've been able to create a lot of change over the years. Um, and I don't know if you are familiar... I did a book, uh, Learning My Rights with Musclemen. Um, and so it's like an illustrated book for children. And it's sort of the start of like a little series I'm doing, which I guess is kind of activism too, because it um, it's all about like teaching children their own rights and like the UN Convention of Children's Rights. Um, because I think that like abuse prevention is sort of another area that plays into everything else. <laughs> like, you can you can try and stop people from abusing. You can try to stop the government from abusing. But the best thing is to teach children like to say no to it themselves, right? So, um, so yeah, it's been an interesting journey. Like I just I feel like I definitely get led by like my ancestors to do certain work because I feel strongly about it, and I do think that the art form has a huge transformational power. Like it it really. Um, it really connects you to something bigger than yourself and and it gives you something to um like be proud of and feel good about and i find like when i teach courses or i teach people and we do like form line or like regalia or whatever it is you know it just um it really gives a feeling of connection and confidence and like um confidence in our culture is obviously something that was attempted to be erased and so it's just it's a huge important thing for us like it it helps us it's our way of visually speaking i guess you know yeah no definitely no question no question at all um you, you bring up something really interesting that i'd like to uh, kind of see if i can get you talked a bit more about for the audience um and that's the the process of becoming an artist on the northwest coast and the you talk about the the kind of the the, the generations of heritage that you draw on to do that so i'm i'm really interested if you could talk a little bit about about how the art tradition has come down to you and how you personally kind of became an artist, the kind of okay. processes that you went through. In general, uh, processing to become an artist is like done through apprenticeship still on the Northwest Coast. Um, and then also studying old pieces because obviously a lot, there was sort of a gap um, between the old masters and residential school happening and potlatching being illegal and stuff. Um, and unfortunately, during that time, like the majority of our pieces that we held in community were all taken into museums in different places. A lot of the time they were stolen and then sold, but um, or else confiscated because it was illegal to potlatch. Um, but yeah, so a lot of what we do now is like trying to look back on what we can find and see to study it um, as if to learn from the old masters ourselves. So we rely a lot on books and um, like museum studies and then uh, apprenticeships. So for me, obviously, my dad is an artist. He's a Simshan artist. He primarily does large scale sculpture like bowls and stuff. Um, 
So I definitely used to just do things with him when I was younger. Um, and then as I got a bit older, I sort of like followed my passions, which originally I went to fashion design school. Um, and so I, when I was in design school, I was learning sort of like form line and painting and stuff. Um, form line, just to, to explain, is like this style of Northwest Coast art. We call it form line. Um, and and then, yeah, I did a bunch of different schooling after that. I also did apprenticeship. So I worked I worked primarily with um, Haida artists named Richard Adkins. Um, he also worked a lot with Bill Reed. Um, and he's a pretty well known for engraving and repose. So and form line. So I've, I've studied with him for like over 20 years. I still go work with him when I need help with something. Um, and I also work with another Simshan artist, Phil Gray, who's been really helpful. And I just have like other carving buddies now that I go hang out with um, when I can. Um, and then I've also done some more traditional schooling. Like I've worked with a German goldsmith for almost five years, Gerald Mueller. And again, I still meet with him and talk to him when I need help with things. Um, but mostly I'm just on my own now. I've been doing the art form for quite a long time. Um, and so, yeah, for me, it was really like a mix of like apprenticeship and taking some schooling courses and um, sort of deciding what I wanted to be doing. Um, I chose to be multidisciplinary because I really like to work in a lot of different mediums. I enjoy working with my hands. So like anything tactile, anything difficult, I want to learn it. And um, yeah, pretty much just gone from there. But I... I basically have been self-employed since uh, maybe 20 at the latest. Um, and I'm 39 this year. <laughs> so it's been a while. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, so yeah, have you taken on any apprentices yourself yet or are you still working yeah, towards Yeah. I do actually have a few apprentices. And I have a few more coming this year of people that have applied for some funding to work with me. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. I've I've bought a couple more benches, so we're going to be doing some jewelry okay. here and probably some wood carving and regalia over the next year. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, that'd be good. that's great. Now, one of the one of the things I wanted to to ask you about, um, based on come, coming from what you've just said, is um, one of the things that we try to tackle in the exhibition is the notion of authenticity. And and museums in Britain historically have had this obsession about what is an authentic Indigenous piece and what isn't and um, one of the things that I've always found really fascinating about Northwest Coast art is its ability to adapt to uh, techno new technologies and new designs and new styles and, and to kind of build kind of creatively on that. So I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about how you use technology in your work and, and um, uh, you know, how you incorporate it in relation to the kind of historical traditions that you're working with. Um, I'm probably not an artist that uses technology as much as a lot of other artists do. Um, I have done a few sort of installations and I have a young fellow who he's a young native guy and he does really well with technology stuff. So he's helped me to sort of like do some um, computer cutout items and stuff for larger scale installations. But um, in general, myself, um, I've used technology to uh, promote and build my brand and connect with clients. Um, and I've been really successful with that. Um, and I guess um, technology in terms of like my actual workshop, I tend to use really old school technology. I'm very like hands based. Um, like I just use like hand engravers that, that I made myself. <laughs> um, and and so a lot of the technologies that I'm working with, even my goldsmith technologies are very old school. Like I learned in a very traditional German goldsmith um, type of way. So I'm using some some machines, but it's a very like five generations at least of, of the same technology there. So I really enjoyed integrating with um, sort of German goldsmithing because it's a very old art, similar to Simshan art is a very, very old art. So like there's techniques that are very ancient and I felt really comfortable with working with those and sort of integrating them into my practice. Like I'm like, oh, this is 
you could do this with no lights with a fire you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's great. um so let's talk about your your jewelry and uh, can we talk a bit about about um kind of the style you bring to to your jewelry and, and the what your priorities are when you're making it in terms of yeah you're thinking about your audience and your your style your design um yeah so i would say like with all my work i tend to like i want to push the boundaries like visually and stylistically but i always keep the like the form line or the sculpture really traditional um so like for example one of the frontlets that was in my rural portrait show like you can look at it and it looks like a regular frontlet but if you look at it closer it's all silver faces and different like a melding of like metals and woods but i do like to keep a very traditional simshian look to things um so i but i like to push the boundaries a bit with like mixing materials and um making really modern interesting designs um a lot of what my focus is in terms of like my sort of day-to-day work is really just um continuing to learn and to practice the the things that i want to be good at so like say like like simshian style faces and i really like to to do those and i feel like i haven't even gotten through all the variations yet so and then yeah like and i'm also like i have an obsession with frontlets um just there's certain items that are really interesting to me like combs so i think i really um i do a lot of work around sort of creating new pieces that are are based around my studies of the old works um because the old works it's like there's just certain types of pieces that i'm really drawn to and you know and and so that's where my mind sort of goes when i'm working it's like oh i'm like i want to like try and make that um challenges from the old masters you know (laughs) and then just like also yeah like just finding interesting things that other people are really focused on as well because i'm not like very like um held in by like commercial industry like i deal with them a bit but it's not like like i just kind of do what what i want to do most of the time so i get to focus on things that are just interesting to me and a lot of that has ended up becoming which i sort of discovered through royal portrait ended up becoming sort of a study of like matriarchy and like what that looked like pre-contact and how we can like you know reinstitute some of these things where they're not in practice as much um like currently i'm like really obsessed with librettes <laughs> right yes they um there are a number of masks in the um exhibition that have um that full you know, full face masks with for uh, depicting women with librettes and they um yeah they're impressive if if uncomfortable looking things yeah so there's so it's like well, this is one of the things i'm working on right now which i have been for a while which is just sort of finding ways to make them like wearable again and like reintegrate that back in because there's there's some things that i think we can just find modern ways of doing it um that will work for our people in this day and age in our societies but then we're still we need to still have those things that were law pre-contact and and like we need to be able to live with them in this modern world. So kind of finding like ways to um, to read, put things back into society that are maybe out of practice because of just like nobody's really sat down and tried to figure out how to like, <laughs> how to make them differently for now. <laughs> Absolutely. And when you're doing, you mentioned earlier that you, you, you know, visit museums to visit things that may have been stolen or taken in the past. Is, is that is that part of the work that you're doing now when you're thinking about librettes or other, you know, um, uh, parts of the book? Yeah, I would like to. I haven't visited any so far, but I, I would like to set up some visits if I can. Um, I've mainly just been doing my research um, online and through books and then old, like old doc, old ethnology documents because um, I've been studying some like medicine stuff as well, which is really interesting. But my dad is like very historian me so he it, i'll be like i need this and he'll send me like this 350 page document and i'm like oh this is a lot to read okay <laughs> but then you have to cross-reference it with like um elders and stuff right to sort of like be like okay this is what was written down what do you remember about this what do you know if there's like other you know traditions around this because as, as as somebody who's who's kind of researched they all these you know, all the historical papers and stuff that the number of times that um the anthropologists have written down things that clearly when they were not being told the truth because people yeah. didn't want to tell them the truth is yeah so there's a lot of 
sort of working sits out. through and just like I feel like that's the life of a Northwest Coast artist though because like Northwest Coast artist is asked to do a lot of things where we have to do it correctly and make sure that it's like legally correct in our system and that like say you're doing a crest for somebody oh do they actually own this crest like you need to know a lot of things um and so yeah we're always sort of sifting through everything and then cross-referencing and then cross-referencing with community and other documents <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah and um and speaking of community i I'm sort of assuming here, but did you you produce uh, you obviously work for sale commercially, and you produce work for exhibition, which I do want to talk about in a minute. But do you produce work that's used in the community as well? I'm assuming for uh, you know, about part yes. of that events and yeah. And is is there? Can you talk about that? And I'm particularly interested in if there's a difference in approach between depending on who the audience is, or whether you're just focusing on what matters most to you and getting getting the, the artwork right. Um. Well. Uh, the way I've built my business is sort of like my the primary people who buy even my more commercial work are usually um, like native people. Um, and then like almost all my custom work is usually like also native people, native women or two spirit people. So um, I'm really lucky because I get to work with people where it's generally like always like this is my crest. This is what you know, like it's um, I get to learn a lot of history through that. Um, and so. So yeah, I'm able to really like do what I want, but I think it lines up with what other people want from my community because we like we all sort of have these same like obsessions. I think come from just our bloodlines like <laughs> like in, I think we're all all indigenous femmes like are like generally obsessed with clam beds on the coast and I feel like sometimes I've created this like little ocean like in my studio because I've just got all these like little clam just shells, different things that I'm and I'm sort of casting and engraving and finding new ways to integrate it into sort of like our future, you know, um, in mm -hmm. different ways. Absolutely. Um, what a wonderful metaphor. <laughs> um, and um, uh, I do want to talk a little bit about, so you've, you've done a number of shows in museums, both kind of contributing your work the way you have here at the Sainsbury Centre, but also kind of curating your own exhibitions. Yes. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that experience and where your priorities lie when you're when you're approaching something like that um yeah it's interesting so i sort of co-curated my last show um at bill reed gallery and then that show almost the same was went sent down to the metal museum in memphis um so i think it's just i i really i have really specific visions and i like things to look a certain way and i really want them to be presented in a certain way um like wording and description is really important to me. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I think I tend to like to have a lot of control over things. Um, and like, for example, this is not a show. This is the most woman book. Like I didn't like the, the publishing company wasn't like, Oh, like, can you do this for us? I just like did everything, put a package together and then brought it exactly how I wanted it and was like, okay, can we, do it this way can we scan these in use the drawing photos and then you guys add the text so <laughs> i sort of approach my work like that a lot of the time where i think it comes from in my early career when sometimes things would go into shows and then i felt that they weren't represented properly or they were misrepresented or just like not displayed well um and so yeah i definitely got a lot tighter about making sure that everything comes together in a way where it makes sense and it tells the story of what I'm trying to tell, which obviously is is sort of in line with everything we've been talking about. Um, it's like, how do we how do we show not just other Native people, but the world, like what our culture looks like, you know, in this in this day and age, which is complex, you know. Um, obviously, we have like our tra very traditional styles of stuff. And then we also have like our youth and we have all these like modern stuff that's going on. Then we have all the issues that we're dealing with all the time. So, like, how do we sort of show like how our culture interacts with all these things now, um, and and trying to sort of visually disseminate that has has been a bit of a goal for me, and I I think I'll continue to work with that idea. Yeah. Um, well, I have to say that having you know worked with you on, um, you know, you getting your works into into this show that you were you were always collegiate and supportive and helpful. I didn't didn't get a sense of you kind of kind of like that but it, it's it's um um yeah when you do kind of send your work kind of overseas long distances that kind of thing um 
yeah, I wonder if you talk a little bit about that that kind of feeling of communicating with with these very distant audiences who really don't have a lot of kind of background knowledge about about indigenous priority of indigenous life and and kind of where you you've already talked about this a bit but kind of what you want them to take away um in that experience yeah i think it's just like i think i guess for me it's it's important that um you know for one thing to connect with other people emotionally in different places of the world and because i feel like that is important for people to understand like that I find that sometimes in Europe, like I've traveled there quite a bit, that there's sort of like, a, like they, they've seen natives on TV kind of thing. So they don't always have like, like a real understanding of like our sort of vibrant continuing culture that's alive. Um, and so I think that's something that I really always want to portray is like we are like living, vibrant people who are continuing to create culture. And like basically like regardless of how much they could take away, we can make new, you know, beautiful things because you can't take away who we are like we just we're gonna keep coming back so um and I I think it's it's also interesting because you end up connecting with indigenous people in different places as well too so but yeah I think it's just like creating emotional connection where people sort of understand and see like native people as like living culture (laughs) instead of like a past thing you know that's exactly what I got from the royal portraits when I first saw them and that's exactly why I wanted them to be the last thing people see as they leave the exhibition so I think that um, that comes across superbly in, yeah, in, in and those like, works. Just one other note, I guess, is like it's like also for people to when they do see indigenous people, like to see how powerful and like strong they are. It, it not just represented as like tragedy all the time. Like there is a lot of tragedy and a lot of like pain, but like like let's also like like you know <laughs> there's some beautiful things going on and it's amazing. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> the um the, the Cherokee scholar Taylor Norman's written about this, and she talks about uh, needing native joy in in exhibitions. So that was yeah. something I was really you know really trying to get across. And although your royal portraits deal with some very heavy and serious issues, that I think there is a sense of celebration and and yeah. power and joy in them. So I I uh, I think that comes across superbly. Um, I wanted to. Uh, yeah, so you've you've done quite a wide range of other artworks as well. Uh, we talked about the jewelry, we've talked about the the photography and the the, the frontlets a bit. But as you know, um, wonder if you could talk about some of the other areas that you've worked in um, over, over the course of your career, and then kind of what you're hoping to do next. Um, yeah, so I guess like sort of looping back on doing <laughs> items for community, <laughs> like so I I do a fair amount of regalia items, which is sort of like button blankets. It's items of spiritual use that people wear um to eat feel empowered in our culture and they use them for dance and feast and different things um but i've sort of like focused a lot of my regalia during royal royal portrait was to create regalia for um people to use who are out doing land defense or doing mmiw work because i think that that sort of protection and that visual protection even is really important for them as well um and it can also be used in feast as well i I do quite a bit of regalia for feast as well. So, so that's something else, which is mainly like painted leather items, um, different items that are placed upon people to, while they're trying to get their chieftainships or et cetera. Um, and yeah, this, I, I also have done a few installations. I've done, I do a lot of drawing. I like to, I like to do children's books. <laughs> Because I have also a black and white book for babies. Like I just I like to do that because I think it's, I have my daughter and I I feel like there there could be more out there for in, that's in Northwest Coast style. Um, kids like kids really connect to it. So um, and then yeah, like I'm basically I'm I'm working on some um, projects with some Afro Indigenous performers. Who are really cool so i'm excited to sort of like highlight some performers um which is a little bit different than the activism side of things they're you know they're out there doing these shows and stuff and it's, it's entertainment so it's, i thought i'd try something new um and then also i'm really gonna focus a lot on my wood carving this year so that should be fun because a lot of time i get um really wrapped up with all my jewelry stuff but now that I, as I said, I have a few apprentices now, so it's helping out just sort of t- 
take some of the easier stuff off of my list and I'll be able to focus on a bit of um, doing a bit of difficult things again, learning. Like with my wood carving, I I am still getting confident with it. I, I tend to still like to work around like mentors or friends if I have questions and stuff. So I, I'm looking forward to getting as confident with that as I am with my jewelry because my jewelry, I've been doing it for so long that I just like, I don't have to even really think about it. I can just do fun stuff and try difficult things. <laughs> so um, are you going to start small or are you going to use a full totem pole straight off the bat? What's the... Uh... Um, no, I would like to do a pole. We've started, I started a few sort of um, topper pieces for poles. I don't know if you've seen those, you know, where there's like a raven or a eagle on top. Um, so I am working on some that I would like to go out on the territories. Um but I am working with my friend Phil on that because he's really, really confident with um, pole carving. Um, and then, yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to do it all. But I, I'll probably be just starting with some frontlets because I have some wood here that has been waiting, and it's perfect for frontlets. So, and I just like I said, I have a love of frontlets. <laughs> yes. One of the things we get quite a lot of questions about, which uh, just occurred to me, we good thing to ask you was was about the woods that we use, that you know, to yes. use the show. And I was wondering what kind of um, what kind of woods are you planning to use for for the frontlets, and then obviously for the the full totem pole. Yes, well, frontlets are generally done with hardwood or semi hardwood, so usually um, something like alder or maple. Um, and I actually have a nice chunk of yew wood right now, so I'm probably going to do one out of that. Um, I have a bunch of alder in my freezer, so I'll probably be doing some projects with that as well. And generally, totem poles are almost always cedar. So yeah, usually red cedar we would use for that. But sometimes they use yellow, but yellow tends to crack a lot. I asked about a lot. And, um, <laughs> Interesting. Uh, in, in, <laughs> in my previous study, I did a big study of wood used in carving, so I was really interested to get your feedback on that. Um, where next in terms of... of activism where what would you like to really see change um over the next sort of generation i guess um in, in response to all of this this activism that's happening and this this art that's supporting it um i mean personally i'd, I'd really like to see just like a way better system in place and i think that um i think that that has a lot to do with um interconnectivity on the northwest coast I think that once all the nations are able to feast together again more as we did pre-contact, which is sort of slowly happening, I think it's going to bring a lot of changes um, in the power structure here. Uh, there's just so many gaps in um, funding from government. I think that there's so many gaps in like the way policing is happening. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to be hopeful, but I also don't know if that's something that that's going to happen without a lot of continued work on our part. And, and honestly, like, I think that that's, it's very generational. Like it's not something that like, it's something that our parents did and we're doing and, and our children are probably doing. I don't know how fast that's going to change. I think that we can just continue doing the work and it can continue getting better. Hopefully. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so um, I'm conscious that we've been talking for nearly an hour. So I wanted to just uh, say as a kind of last last kind of question uh, before we wrap up, I wanted to say, um, is there anything that you want to say to to the audience here in Norwich that you think the people here really should know about your work or about the Northwest Coast um, that, do, that we haven't already discussed? To give you a chance to, to talk about that, anything, anything that I've missed, basically. Our... Um... Yeah, I'm not too sure what to say, I guess. I mean, like, if you like the work and how it looks and, and you're interested in the topics, like, please, like, take some time to, like, educate yourself some more and um, support it if you can. There's lots of people doing cool stuff over here. And even sometimes in the UK, like, people travel and do events mm -hmm. and stuff. So I think, yeah, just, like, if you can support the community in any way, that's great. Um, and if not, just enjoy the show and whole something to absolutely. think about <laughs> absolutely well uh morgan i want to uh a huge thank you for joining joining me today i think you've, you've given some absolutely fascinating answers that i i found extremely interesting and i'm sure the audience will as well and we really really appreciate your time and we really appreciate your support and generosity during the the putting together of this show so that we can have your wonderful royal portrait series in, in the exhibition so thank you very very much 
Yes, thank you. Um, it's been really fun, and I'm looking forward to seeing some photos and videos of what it looks like. Yeah. <laughs>